Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. You can find all the old shows, nominate new shows, look at a list of people we're looking at talking to. Uh, also, I have here Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of Open MPI. Jeff, uh, once again, you grace us with your presence. Ah, you're far too kind, Brock. This is uh, great stuff. And today we're going to be uh, looking at uh, a project, actually kind of a suite of projects. I mean, we're going to be talking about one of them in particular, but uh, there's actually a whole bunch of uh, additional tools that integrate nicely with it. And uh, it's something that most people don't think about too much and they just kind of assume. But uh, having really good tools in this area is actually really, really important. You'll find in, 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 or at least my experience has been in, in most software projects, there's only one or two people who really understand the, the tools in this particular area. Yeah. So the project we're talking about today is actually the CMake. Um, I want to call it a build system, but I think it does more than that. So we'll let our guests actually describe what that is when we get into that. Uh, our guest is another representative from Kitware who we've had on the show, uh, represented on the show before. Uh, Bill, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? Sure, thanks for the uh, kind words about uh, CMake. I'm one of the original founders of Kitware. I've, I did my uh, master's degree at Rensselaer Polytech Institute, RPI. I spent about nine years at GE's um, research center in Niskayuna, which is shockingly enough where Kitware is located now, about 15 minutes away from there. Kitware, I started in 1999 with uh, four other folks. And the CMake project was actually came out of one of our first projects with the National Library of Medicine and the uh, Insight Toolkit creation in early 2000. We were actually tasked with creating a build system, and that's where CMake got its beginnings. So describe CMake. Uh, some people maybe use like the regular GNU or POSIX Make before, but uh, describe CMake and what it does. Sure. Well, CMake is a meta-build system, and in fact, many people that use CMake use GNU Make all the time. So what CMake does is the user would provide a simple input of what they want built. I want a library, and here are the source files, and then CMake would generate maybe GNU Make files, maybe Visual Studio Project files, maybe Xcode Project files, and then the user would use those tools to actually do the build. So what's the difference here? Why why do we need another make like utility? I mean, make is is pretty prevalent in in POSIX like systems. Now you did mention cross system support like a Visual Project and whatnot, but does anybody use the X11 project files anymore? Or you know what, what's kind of the advantage of CMake over the traditional make? Certainly, the cross platform nature of it is a huge advantage, and one of the main reasons people adopt it. However, the, the make files that it generates are also very interesting, even in a POSIX world, in that they have uh, progress reporting as they're building. They do nice colored output. They abstract away, you know, building a shared library is, you know, just create library, and you don't have to figure out what particulars are involved with doing that on different systems. So how is that different than, say, uh, you know, one of your, your, the, probably the most obvious of your competition here is AutoMake, which uh, doesn't really do progress or color, but it does do things like, hey, just make me a library, you know, magic go. Sure. I think one of the, the – again, the cross-platform nature of it would be one of the major advantages. Um, the AutoTools project works fine as long as you have a complete Unix system, and it uses, you know, Bash and – M4 and a whole other host of tools. CMake was designed really to only, the only thing it really depend on, depended on was a C++ compiler. So should we, for, for in, so a little sidetrack here, does that mean CMake itself is written in C++? It is. It's C and C++. Okay. And uh, so what, I, there, I, I understand there's a bunch of other advantages versus the auto tools too. You want to give a little blow by blow of uh, some of your, your cool features? Sure. Um, TeamMake has the ability to uh, you know, build cross-platform um, with only a C++ compiler. And again, I think one of the really strong points of CMake is that it takes advantage of 
the most scarce resource on a project, and that's the people working on it. And those people, everyone, if you look at Cross Kitware, there's people that really like Visual Studio. They like developing on Windows. There's the people that use uh, Qt Creator and they're Linux developers. There's people like me that use Emacs on the command line. And all those people can work on a project together with CMake because it's actually generating the build tool of choice for the developers instead of forcing all the developers on the team to use a particular tool set. Um, so that, that, I think, is a big advantage, that it can actually take advantage of those developer skills and allow them to use the tools they want. So, so you're actually having people developing on different platforms on a single project. Uh, does CMake do any type of verification that the code they're writing is portable between systems, or is CMake completely unaware of any of that? CMake itself is just a build system, so it really, you know, you can put any code you want in there, and it will uh, obviously not build cross-platform if it doesn't build on that platform. However, like you mentioned in the beginning, there's more to CMake than just a build tool. It's actually grown into a family of tools. Um, there's CTest, which runs tests in a project. There's CDash, which is a web-based application. Again, these are all open source tools and fit into this family of tools. CDash is a PHP-based um, LAMP stack web application that displays test results a continuous integration system similar to uh, Hudson. And then finally, C CMake also comes with a tool called CPAC, which can create Windows installers or RPMs or Debian packages automatically using the install rules already in your CMake project. So CMake itself is written in C++ and all these other tools. They're independent. Like You don't have to adopt the entire CMake environment with CTest and CPAC, or can you take pieces? You can take pieces. Um, some people use it just for the build system. Some people use the whole suite. Obviously, CDash is completely separate. That's a separate application. Um, Kitware hosted, um, cdash.org. There's also my CDash. If you want to try it out, you can create a hosted project really quick. But it's not tied with CMake. CTest and CPAC are actually C++ binaries that ship um, bundled with CMake, so they're always available. Um, one of the restrictions of CMake, I think, is that we always want whatever tools are available, if you're going to actually call them from a build file, we want to make sure that the core, um, the core testing and packaging are always available on all the platforms. And the only way to do that is to bundle them with, with CMake itself. So is CMake itself distributed in, in uh, popular Linux distros, or, or is it mainly downloaded via the Internet? CMake's actually had quite a, uh, a growth in downloads from, from our site. I think we get somewhere around 1,800 to 2,000 downloads a day of the CMake binary and sources. But CMake is also included in all the major Linux distributions, um, Siglin, um, so that um, OS X ports. So CMake's readily available everywhere, and that was a one of the problems early on is sort of a chicken and the egg thing. We've got this new tool, but you have to install the binary to do your build. Um, but that's changing over time. Um, I won't belabor it much longer other than say that the KDE adoption had a lot to do with that popularity. So, yeah, this is exactly uh, uh, an important point because way back eons ago when we started the OpenMPI project, we were looking at all the various build tools that were available at the time, and uh, we did not want to introduce a dependency on a, on a build tool so that, you know, we were the, the new MPI implementation on the block, and we wouldn't want to say, oh, yes, to try out our awesome code, you got to go first get this build tool, and then you can build open MPI. And so that was why we ultimately ended up going uh, with the auto tools um, at that time, because they do a wonderful job of, of bootstrapping uh, a tarball so that when you download the OpenMPI tarball, you don't need to have the auto tools installed. All you need are compilers and, and make. Does CMake do something like that, or does it still require uh, you know, a source tarball that was created with CMake? Does that need to have CMake installed on the target machine? Okay, that, that, that's a really good question and sort of, certainly a, a sticking point for uh, CMake adoption. But CMake, yes, it does have to be installed on the system. 
It's used in the make files. They call CMake back to generate dependencies, which is one of the other features I forgot to mention earlier, is that CMake does source, source level dependencies. It goes through and looks for what files are included, um, generates those. Um, like I said, the color output, that's coming from the CMake binary. And again, this is how we get the cross-platform ability, because essentially we're providing a, a, a shell or a set of tools that's, that's always around on your build platform. And you, you can't really, other tools get away with it because they say, well, we require a POSIX Unix environment to be around for the build. So it's actually quite a bit of um, stuff that has to be around. Um, gotcha. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a fair assumption that, yeah, you don't need to have auto tools installed, but you need to have everything else installed. <laughs> um, all right, so then let me uh, let me shift the, the question a little bit here and say, is there ever or does it even make sense to have a, a bootstrapped ability in a platform independent way such that, uh, you know, the, the, the first thing that's in the project file or the first thing that's in the make file is to build a mini CMake in itself so that it can build the rest of the project. Does, does that even make sense? Has there ever been any request for that? Certainly there's been a request for it, and, and the early CMake actually did that with um, the Insight Toolkit I talked about in the 2000. The first thing it did is it had like a little configure-like script that built CMake, and then CMake built the system. And it, this certainly could be done today, but with the ubiquitous um, availability of CMake, it's really becoming less and less of a problem. I mean, at some point, you know, people don't say, well, you know, I don't want to use GMake because you have to have GMake installed, you know. It's it's getting really easy. There's package managers, you know, apt get CMake, you're done. Um, there's a whole bunch of other tools you're depending on in your project too. Um, and again, if you get really stuck with CMake, really all you need is the C++ compiler, um, and to be able to build it. And also, Kitware provides binaries for all the major platforms. We even go through a, sort of a a lot of trouble to make sure our Linux binary that we provide works on all the platforms. It's actually building on I think a 10-year-old version of Mandrake so that it's completely backwards compatible. Wow. Nice. <laughs> that's uh, that's painful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when that machine dies, we're in trouble. We're going to try to virtualize it in the next uh, couple months. So let's get a little bit more of this history. The the one toolkit you mentioned was what you kind of made CMake for that originally. Did At that time, did you envision kind of keeping CMake out as a separate thing, or was it even called CMake then? Um, I don't think it was called CMake right then. It was sort of the ITK build system, and that, that's actually a great segue to a story. I was uh, So the Insight Toolkit was a segmentation and registration toolkit for medical data, um, mainly funded by the National uh, Library of Medicine to work with the visible human data set. And they, we were one of the engineering leads, and I was, pitching my idea of this new build system to a group of uh, people working on the project. And one of the guys raised his hand and said, Bill, what are you doing creating a new build system? You know, it's going to be the, you know, the ITK weird build system. Why don't you use something that's already out there? And before he finished his sentence he, and let me answer, he sort of said, oh, wait, wait, Bill, I, I see what you're doing. You're not creating a build system for ITK you're creating a brand new C++ build system for the rest of the world. And you know, that's, that's what we were doing. And it definitely took, uh, took a long time for it to get traction. So what are some of the projects that are using CMake? Uh, you mentioned KDE. What are some of the other ones that are using it? Sure. So um, well, obviously the Kitware suite of tools using it, Paraview, VTK, some other ones include, uh, there's quite a long list, but uh, Open Scene Graph uses it, Blender 3D, uh, ITK, of course, uses it, Quantum GIS, um, Second Life is one of the more popular packages that uses it, Ogre uses it, GDCM, uh, Bullet Phys Physics Engine, Avogadro, um, quite a host of uh, KDE applications. Uh, MySQL is another really um, popular one that, that uses it. They recently, they were using it originally only for their Windows build, and they recently made it for all their builds. The new compiler, LLVM, also uses it. 
So actually, OpenMPI falls in that same category. Uh, we use CMake for our Windows build. Um, we still have fairly extensive uh, auto tool support on the POSIX side. We've talked about merging it all over into CMake, but no one's had the time and resources to do it, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, very definitely on the on the Windows side, there's quite a bit of logic and uh, stuff over there um, that all the, the good people at HLRS maintain for us. Um, sure, and like I said, that's that's how it started with uh, MySQL, and for years, that's that's what they had, um, sort of a dual build system. And I think six months ago or so, they finally uh, unified the build system. What other languages does CMake uh, support? So obviously C and C plus plus, but uh, what other things can it build? It can build uh, Fortran, which is uh, really important, I think, for the scientific community. Um, we've actually, uh, LotPak uses it as a, one of their build systems. And our Fortran support actually supports Fortran 90. So it actually, there's a full Fortran parser inside CMake. And this is sort of a funny story. One of the, one of the guys here helped someone port some code over to CMake. It was a Fortran based code. And he was telling the guy how to use it. And he says, well, you type CMake and then you type make. And then it builds your project. And the guy said, you mean I only have to type make once? Because these Fortran 90 projects, they have modules, and you have to build them in the right order so that the modules are there when the project goes to include it, and they're sort of byproducts of the build, and unless you build it in the exact right order. And what a lot of Fortran 90 programmers do is they just keep typing make over and over again, and after about seven times, it, it actually works. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh that's pretty terrible I, I was on mute before you didn't hear me chuckle when you said that the first time but uh i can confirm that uh disastrous build systems like that are out there and in, in real world uh usage and that's uh it's terrible <laughs> and that's why tools like this exist um so let me ask you a derivative question then going off on the fortran bit i'm actually involved in the, the fortran mpi3 Effort And so I know a, a bunch more about Fortran than I ever thought I would. Um, Fortran 2008, for example, is an incredibly subtle language. It's not uh, – it ain't your father's Fortran 77. Are you guys keeping up with all the syntax for, for that stuff as well? I mean I, I assume you don't need full Fortran parsing. You just need to be able to figure out dependencies and the like, right? Yeah, we basically just need to be able to figure out the uh, – use what, what's, being used, what's being produced and what's being used by each module so that we can create a correct graph and then build them in the right order. So Fortran 90 has, it, it works a lot like Java actually. Um, you say, you know, use some module or produce some module. And we just basically need to parse enough of it to figure out what it's producing and what it's using. And then we can figure okay. out the order of the build. All right, and so, so we got kind of distracted. What are the other languages that you're able to build? So you said C, C++, Fortran. Do you do things like Java and Others? Our Java support is admittedly weak. Um, people do Java with it, but you can so you can do custom commands in CMake where you can basically run any anything you want. Um, you know, something that produces something that produces something. So a lot of people do Java like that. They might even run um, Ant from CMake, but we don't. We haven't spent a lot of time on sort of native Java support. Another powerful thing that CMake can do is these through these custom commands is code generators, um, things like mock or you know, things like swig, which actually has quite high demands on a build system. Oh, that's cool. So CMake has a lot more understanding of the underlying code. I mean, normal make, I'm used to always saying that you know, this object file depends on this source file, and so I can make it understand that it needs to c compile this Fortran thing, get the module before it compiles the next one that uses that module. Uh, so it understands this. I don't have to keep track of all this myself. I can just kind of point it at my source code and go. Is it that easy? It's that easy, yeah. And it does that with C, C++, and Fortran. It can parse the code and figure out the include dependencies and then make sure things are up to date. So then uh, does CMake have any parallelism in it, or does it just make all these dependencies correctly and then you use, like, makes parallel build with a minus J? Yeah, that, that's what we depend on is the underlying build system's parallelness. 
uh, and generating correct make files so that that will that will work. Um, so yeah, make minus j is what we use on systems that support it. So another interesting tool we're looking at: someone's working on a, a Ninja generator for CMake, which is a new build type tool from Google, sort of a low-level make replacement to do better parallelism. So we talked a little earlier about uh, what languages you support. Um, what, and, and you mentioned that uh, you know, CMake is included in all the popular Linux distros and OS X via ports, and it obviously must be uh, available to work on Windows since we talked about visual project files and so on. So that's a pretty good list of systems. What list of what's your list of compilers that you support? So, like on Linux alone, there's four or five different popular compilers. In addition to you know the GNU suite, um, particularly that in the HPC arena, people like to use because there's a lot of religious factions about this compiler gives me better numeric performance and this compiler gives me better X Y Z performance and things like that. And they all have slightly different rules for making, say, shared libraries. So what uh, what's the your laundry list of compilers that you support? Okay, sure. The uh, list of compilers that CMake supports, I think, is fairly complete. I don't have a list off the top of my head. I would have to dig down and, and look at the dashboard. And the dashboard is our continuous integration testing system. So when people come to me and say, hey, do you support this compiler? Can you help me get that compiler working? I say, sure, as long as you'll contribute a dashboard. And what that means is running a build with that compiler and putting the results every night up on the CMake dashboard. And this is really important for, for CMake development because if someone comes to me and says, you know, I want compiler X to work with CMake, if I just work with them and get it done once, it'll probably work for about six months until we check in something that happens to break it. But I, I think our tool set is pretty complete. If you can find one that doesn't work with it, it it's probably, uh, I'd like to hear about it, and maybe we can set up a dashboard and get it working. But we're pretty uh, proactive when people complain about, you know, something not being supported. And the addition of compilers, especially in a POSIX environment, requires only adding a few text files into the module directory of CMake. So it's actually pretty easy to do it, even if it's not built into the binary. The, the support for the compilers is not in C++. It's in the CMake language. So we've talked a lot about build and comparing it against make, actually compiling your code. What if I have options? I want to include this library or enable, disable GPU support. Uh, we're so used to configure dash dash with library path. Uh, does CMake handle that kind of functionality also? Sure, it, it really does a good job of that. That's probably one of its strong suits that I should have mentioned. It's, it actually has a full configurable GUI that it can run. Um, it's a cute based GUI that shows all the options for a project. You can turn things off like you know, build with MPI, build without MPI. So it's got a full configurable GUI, and you can also do it from the command line as well. Ah, good. That's what I, I wanted to hear because uh, we're, we're all about automated builds and things like that. So GUI's good, uh, automation, command line types things better. So is this kind of analogous to autoconf, uh, you know, configures dash dash with foo and dash dash enable foo and things like that? Yeah, and it's, it's customizable on the project. So the CMake actually has what's called a... Uh, set of cache variables, and these, when you configure CMake on a project, it writes out a file that stores all the variables for that project that are persistent variables, essentially. We call them cache variables. And they're, they're stored in this file, and then they, they turn things on and off, and they can be things that were discovered through uh, system introspection, or they could be things set by the user. Okay, now you got to forgive me because the majority of my experience is with the auto tools here. So then this sounds a, a lot like you have uh, similar functionality to autoconfs, you know, built-in M4 tests. Like, you know, look for this header file, look for this library, and do these shell things to see if the system supports function XYZ and uh, various things like that. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. CMake has a, what we call, you know, system introspection options. You can do... Try compiles, try compile and run. Um, you can, you know, run run whatever you want and try to discover if a system has certain libraries or header files as well. 
so the system can act, the build can adapt to the, the system that it's on. Okay. And um, one of the biggest problems that the OpenMPI project had with uh, the GNU Auto Tools was that in particular, AutoMake was very much engineered for a, a static uh, directory structure that, uh, you know, I have subdirectories A, B, C, and off of C comes D, E, and F, and that's it. It's it's kind of fixed. But our our developers very much don't want to integrate with the build system. The developers are, you know, C kind of developers, and they're like, holy criminy, I don't want to try and figure out what you guys did with configure and make and things like that. I just want to add a new directory, and the build system picks it up. Um, is that a kind of thing that CMake can do? It could. Um, it, and certainly we've done that in projects. And in fact, in the recent rework of ITK, we've actually had a chance for creating ITK version 4, the Insight Toolkit, where CMake came from, and we had a big modularization effort. And in this system we created, it actually has a bunch of directories, which are all the each module of the system, and CMake automatically figures the ones that are there. And it, users can actually just directly just drop a new module into the system run CMake, and then it'll, it'll pick up the new module. So let's talk about C-Test a little bit. Uh, so CMake, we can turn all these features on and off. If I have a large collection of code with different options, I mean, Jeff, with the MPI stuff, you've got all these different networks and stuff and maybe different options you want to try. Uh, does C-Test enable this? Is it serial, or can I spread that across multiple hosts, or what other things can C-Test plus CMake buy me? I mean, C-Test is really the tool we use to run tests. So inside the CMake language, you could say, you know, add test foobar, and then that would run some application, some executable, and it, by default, looks for, you know, zero, zero for passing, non-zero for, for failing. And then those tests can, the results can be sent to C-Dash or reported right there to the user. So it's really just a a uh, tool used to run run the regression test. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what other features does uh, C-Test provide, though? Okay, well, C-Test has a minus J option, so you can try to run, run the test in parallel if you set that up. It does not support, without some extra work, running it on separate hosts, although we have built systems that, that do that, you know, using, uh, for example, Paraview uses MPI, and we've got, you know, a, a little mini cluster set up, and we run C-Test on it, and it will launch Paraview tests that are actually running on other systems. But that's using external software. It doesn't actually do the SSH pushing or anything like that. Okay, and so C-Test and C-Make, uh, I think you mentioned one other. There was one other tool in this suite of uh, build and testing environment. Yeah, that's called C-Pack. C-Pack? It's a packaging tool, yeah. Okay. Is that requiring special much. tools to use to give people a package to install? In a sense, yes. It works a lot like C-Make does itself, so it's not a packager, although it can create simple packages like tar files. But if you want to create an RPM, it uses the RPM tools. If you, on Windows, it uses the NullSoft installer. So essentially, it's another way of abstracting out your package. Here are the files I want to package. Here's what they look like. And then go ahead and create it for an RPM or a Debian or a Windows installer or a, a Mac installer or a Mac drag and drop bundle. But it allows you to abstract that out and have one central place, the CMake list file, where you tell CMake how to build your system and install it, where you can create this abstract description of the packaging, and then it'll use the native packaging system to create a really nice installer for this system. So how does somebody transition over to using CMake? Like, uh, for example, an auto tools wonk like me, you know, if I wanted to convert over my, my existing code base, um, where would I go about learning about that? Are there examples out there? Or are there some sample projects that are, are, are kind of canonical CMake usage that are good for uh, noobs like myself? Sure, that's a good question. There's, there's a book, of course, you can buy the book. There's a tutorial that's included in the book, and the tutorial is actually part of the test suite of CMake, so that's available. And the uh, tutorial chapter is actually 
uh, freely available online. And CMake really has an excellent mailing list um, that's very uh, proactive and answers your questions um, relatively quickly. The best thing to do would be probably to walk through the tutorial uh, and sort of get a feel for it. And again, it's it's pretty simple stuff at the you know the basic level where you're creating you know, a library and executable things like that. Um, obviously, build systems can get more complicated depending on what you need to do. But start small and then then build up. So does CMake integrate with any IDEs, or are you using though? Do you have to invoke CMake independently? You would invoke CMake once usually on a project. So if you're building a project, you invoke CMake and it generates the build system. And the build system might be the input to an IDE. Once you've generated that once, from then on, if you update, say, an input to CMake, we put hooks into the build so that CMake will rerun and the IDE will then reload the, the project if something changed. So what's the largest thing you've ever, or most complicated, I guess complicated would be the more important thing you've ever seen or you've done yourself with CMake? Well, certainly the most largest would be the KDE build. Um, that's, I think they like to say they're the largest open source project in the world. And it's not a trivial build because they've got things like the mock code generator, which has to be invoked. And again, that was something that was in CMake from the beginning is the, this idea of code generators, since CTK wrapped into multiple languages. And that's sort of as complicated as a build as, as builds get, where you maybe build some C code that builds an executable, and then that executable parses some files and then generates more code, which then needs to be built into a library. And being able to do that round thing and having it work in Visual Studio and Xcode and, and through the make files is non-trivial. So by the same token, uh, I'm actually just, I'm sorry, I'm drawing on my own experience here, but in OpenMPI, we have exactly that problem with some flex and bison files, some, you know, token parsing kinds of code generation stuff. Does uh, CMake support natively invoking flex or lex and bison or yak? Sure, there's a module directory in CMake. Um, that has various packages. I believe there's one for uh, Lex and Bison. And again, it wouldn't it wouldn't be that hard to do with the custom commands where you just and you say you list the inputs and the outputs, and then create custom targets um, for generating code. And, and then if you use the outputs and put them into a shared library or an executable, everything sort of happens in the right order, and CMake does the right thing. So a number of years ago, too, there was this paper um, called Recursive Make is Evil or something like that. I have a dim recollection of that paper um, where they talk about how, you know, make and then invoking make in a subtree and then invoke making, invoking make and yet another subtree is bad, bad, bad for a variety of reasons. It, does CMake take a different approach or do you use a similar approach or, um, you know, how do you, how do you address this kind of issue? Sure. Let me uh, answer that. That actually is a, has an interesting uh, story to it. We, we set out at some point to, uh, and we read the paper, and we said, oh, yeah, we're make generator. We should be able to generate something. And we set out to generate a single monolithic make file. And what we found out, without depending on some of the more advanced features of gmake, because we support other makes as well, um, and being able to do the dependency analysis and the code generation support and the things I talked about with the Fortran, in some instances, recursive make is absolutely required to make sure all that stuff happens in the right order. Um, so we sort of have a hybrid system where it, it does as much monolithic stuff as it can so that when you type make, it'll make sure the targets are built in the right order. But as it gets down to the individual target levels, it may actually invoke make several times just to make sure that all of make's dependencies are set up and done right, correctly. So what's the craziest use of CMake you've ever seen where it's completely unexpected? I suppose watching uh, people use it to build something like LaTeX. So people have used it to build books. Oh, wow. <laughs> but I guess if you're using a programming a... language to write a book, then maybe you need to build a book. <laughs> 
Well, that's a, that's a perfect computer science solution, right? That uh, every every problem in computer science can be solved with another level of abstraction. <laughs> So what are the uh, what are the features in uh, upcoming versions of CMake that we can expect? Uh, what are some cool new things that are coming coming down the pipe? Sure, I think one of the most exciting features we came up with recently is something we call external project. And what this is is actually sort of a a meta CMake build, or maybe even not even a CMake build. And we create what we call we're calling them super builds. So a lot of times it's really complicated these days because everybody wants to use lots of different packages, um, but there really isn't a package manager per se that's across all the systems. But if you're on a development team and you know, you're know you building something that needs Qt and it needs Boost and it needs VTK and maybe it uses Paraview and then sometimes it uses you know, LaPack, what we can do is we have this external project command which can actually go fetch and download either from a Git repository or a tar file or off a website a copy of the system, and then it can configure that, whether it be a CMake build or not, and then build it. And then we can create a system whereby you can get a developer quickly up to speed and have everything built and have it work all across platform. So that's, that's a, a neat feature we added recently, and I think that'll be expanded upon in the next uh, next few years. So what license is CMake under and distributed? It's a BSD license. So it's totally uh, without restriction. And that also covers any, you know, uh, build system specific files that it generates like make files or Visual Studio project files? Sure, I mean, but so the, the make files and Visual Studio projects that it, that it generates still need CMake around. So it doesn't, um, again, going back to it, does CMake need to be installed? And, and it does. So it generates these files, and then, then you build off of them. But you can't redistribute them. wouldn't be uh, worthwhile. Now, how does the, the CMake uh, community work? I mean, what's, what's Kitware's role in the community, are you kind of the benevolent dictator, or are there committers from outside Kitware, or how do you guys function? I think recently we've been moving more away from the benevolent dictator to more of an inclusive uh, community of developers, and we've got even a guy working on adding a new regular expression support through a Google Summer of Code through the KDE project. And what's really enabled this. Expansion is our adoption of distributed version control through Git. So what's the website for CMake and where people can find it and mailing lists? And the website is www.cmake.org, and there's information off about the mailing list there as well. It's cmake at cmake.org is the address. Well, Bill, thank you very much for your time, and we'll have this show out soon. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Well, thank you. It was uh, enjoyable talking to you about CMake, and uh, hopefully uh, we both learned a little bit.